All right, so my message today is uh, from the book of Zephaniah, okay? And uh, most of the passages, with just a couple exceptions, are going to be from the book of Zephaniah. So let me just say that Zephaniah is uh, toward the end of the Old Testament, right after, for example, right after Habakkuk, and... uh, There it is. So, Zephaniah. And um, so, you heard the scripture reading. Let us just uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your continued presence here. We just want to. Thank you for it and open our hearts that uh, in spite of the uh, speaker today and any other distraction that might um, come to bear, that we, by your presence, by your help, your blessing, uh, can be blessed by your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Zephaniah 3.17, uh, again, the Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now we'll come back to that verse. But I want to think about a theoretical scene. I don't have any biography written by a mother in the day of Zephaniah. I'm simply wanting to put ourselves in the shoes of a mother living in Judah at that time. Now, leaving the manuscript for a moment. (laughs) Um, We all know um, the struggles and trials in these last days that parents face in raising uh, their kids. And um, it's it's no different in this country area uh, than I guess one of the There's really no difference between city and country uh, when it comes to the enemy's attack upon families. And and the burdens that mothers carry. So, I'm simply wanting to put ourselves in the shoes of a mother living in Judah in the time of Zephaniah. So when was that time? When did Zephaniah prophesy? Well, in the first verse of his book, he tells us it was in the days of Josiah, the king of Judah. When was that? Josiah reigned as king from 640 to 609 B.C. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Zephaniah prophesied uh, during the whole time of Josiah's reign. We do know that he foretold the destruction of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and this took place in 612 B.C. So we know that he was doing his work before that date. For reasons we'll mention uh, later, it looks like he was prophesying, looks like he was prophesying, uh, before King Josiah's work of reform, which began about 623 B.C. A little more context here. Uh, Jeremiah's call to be a prophet came in 627 or 626 B.C. This uh, was the 13th year of the reign of Josiah. It was 605 B.C. that Judah was conquered by Babylon and Daniel and many other Hebrew youths were carried captive. So that gives us an idea 
of when we're talking about. 600 years before the time of Jesus. Our mother could easily, I will say likely, have been worried about her children. For one thing, she likely would have kept hearing about surrounding nations that wanted to do great harm to her own nation. She would have known that ten of the twelve tribes of her people had already been carried away captive and scattered in the provinces of the Assyrian realm. One of the big worries would have been the Philistines. They were long-standing enemies of her people. Philistia had five city-states, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gaza, and Gath. By the time of Zephaniah, Gath had become insignificant. But in Zephaniah chapter 2, the other four are mentioned. We know the Philistines were far from God-fearing at this time because speaking directly to them in chapter 2 and verse 5, he tells them that, quote, the word of the Lord is against you. In 2 verse 4, he predicts that Gaza will be forsaken, Ashkelon will be desolate, the people of Ashdod will be driven out, and that Ekron shall be uprooted. The descendants of Lot, the Moabites and the Ammonites, were also enemies of God's people, the people of our mother. We know they were a threat because in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 8, God tells them, quote, I have heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. He goes on to say in verse 9 that they will end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. We could talk about other nations, such as Assyria. Yes, a mother living in Jerusalem during the time of Zephaniah had things to be concerned about for her children. But it would have been plain to her that her children were not just in danger from other nations. The problem was not just out there. It was among her own people, the people of God. How could she keep her children from being corrupted by the atheists and the worshippers of idols that seemed to be so abundant? Zephaniah 1, verses 4 and 5. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests. Those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops. Those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom, an Ammonite God. So they were trying, the, uh, among God's people, as this dear mother was seeking to raise her children, among God's people in her neighborhood, they were trying to worship the Lord and a pagan God at the same time. And this is why it seemed clear that Zephaniah began his ministry in the early part of Josiah's reign. Because uh, when in 623 B.C. Josiah began his work of reform, he largely cleansed the nation uh, from idolatry. And verses 4 and 5 uh, seems to describe a situation when that hasn't happened yet. Verse 6 mentions... Uh, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of Him. So this class were not necessarily worshiping idols, but they were not seeking the Lord with their heart and soul either. Verse 14, Who say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, nor will He do evil. They were, fair to say, just complacent. In addition to atheism and idolatry, complacency, the mother 
especially if she was poor, and she probably was, knew her children were in danger from corruption and oppression. Chapter 3, verse 1. Zephaniah refers to Jerusalem as, quote, this is Jerusalem, the oppressing city. And continuing uh, about Jerusalem in verses 3 and 4, God says her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. So the religious leaders were living openly immoral lives. There was all kinds of fraud among the civil leaders. The passage mentions princes and judges. That covers the two civil leadership categories. Uh, he compares them to wild animals, roaring lions and wolves. No wonder a mother would tremble for her children and a godly mother would pray for them day and night. This is the context in which, uh, in chapter 1, starting with verse 14, the Lord says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. It is God's response to all the idolatry, all the immorality among the priests, all the corruption among the civil leaders, including the judges, and all the complacency among the people. In chapter 2, verse 3, the Lord speaks to those who are not involved in all these things. He says, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Well, we do not know exactly when Zephaniah began or ended his preaching. What we do know is that eventually the Babylonians came. They destroyed the city. The beautiful temple that for more than four centuries had sat on Mount Zion was not spared by the Babylonians. Second Chronicles 36.19 says, Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed the city. They carried many of the youth back to Babylon. It was bad. It was real bad. But it was only a partial fulfillment of the words of Zephaniah. His prophecies of impending judgment upon Judah apply with equal force to the judgments that are to fall upon the world just before Jesus' second coming. An infinite mercy, a last warning message is to be sent to the world announcing that Jesus is coming and calling attention to God's broken law. But as the people in the time of the flood rejected with ridicule the message of Noah, so the pleasure lovers of today reject the message of God's faithful servants. The world pursues its unvarying round, absorbed as ever in its business and its pleasures. They say peace and safety, not knowing that sudden destruction will come upon them. But our compassionate Redeemer, foreseeing the perils that would surround His followers at this time, 
has given them has given us. Special warning as recorded in Luke chapter 21 and uh, starting with verse 34. Luke 21 starting with verse 34. Uh, But take heed, Jesus said, to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus gave these words of counsel. Uh, If you would have heard Jesus speak these words, you would have seen uh, the deep concern and pitying love with which He spoke them. Turning again to Zephaniah chapter 3, we read of Jerusalem, that is, of God's people. She has not obeyed His voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. But back to our mother. She and her children certainly live in a dangerous world. And in in her own people there is idolatry and unbelief and complacency. And probably in her own heart there are struggles. Probably she isn't what she feels she ought to be. She longs for a more spiritual life. She longs for a spiritual fellowship. Where will she find help? Where will she find relief? Where will she find hope? Where will she find encouragement? Thank God that in Zephaniah chapter 3, there are promises. The context of these verses is what the Lord wanted to do for His people when they came back after being defeated and for the lucky ones forced to scatter everywhere by the Babylonians. They were lucky to be alive. Jeremiah spoke of this time also. Jeremiah 23, verse 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their faults, and they shall be fruitful and increase. This is a precious promise for parents and their cho- with their children and their grandchildren. Verse 4, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. And also Jeremiah 32, verse uh, 37 and 38. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. But just as the, quote, day of the Lord passages uh, in Zephaniah were only partially fulfilled by the Babylonian attack, so these promises also apply to the last day remnant. Zephaniah 3, verse 9. For then... I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. We love this promise because it is not telling what His people will do, but what the Lord will do in them. I will write my law on their hearts. Here, it is a promise for a remnant. A group of people who are truly serving the Lord. A group of people where a mother would be helped, blessed, and uplifted. Verse 10. 
For beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers. Now, anything beyond Ethiopia, you know, would be symbolic of the uttermost reaches of the earth. So, the final remnant will truly be from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. But back to our verse. Um, For beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. This reminds us of Psalm 51, verse 17, where it says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite Zephaniah 3, picking up at verse 11. In that day, you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. A remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies. Nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, that is, the Lord, who is the King of Israel, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said of Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion, let not your hands be weak. And then our glorious scripture reading. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One will save. If mom or anybody else feels their own weakness, They can look away from themselves and look to the Mighty One. He will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now verses 14 and 16, we just quoted just before this, speak of our rejoicing for what God has done for us or what God will do for us. But this is not what verse 17 is talking about. No, it says, He, God, rejoices over His redeemed. He rejoices over His redeemed with singing. So if our mother or anybody else is Tempted to feel she is not really worth that much? Well, there could not be any greater contradiction to that thought than this verse. God wants to have a living relationship with you. Isaiah 62 verse 5 says it again. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride... So shall your God rejoice over you. To think, let's get this in our mind and our heart right here as I close. To think that when the redeemed arrive around the throne, the whole universe. will join with the Father in His song of rejoicing. Heaven and earth will unite in the Father's song of rejoicing. And we can hear the echo uh, 
in the Luke chapter 15, prodigal son. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Dear fellow sojourners, fellow strugglers, let us have, by God's grace, in our mind and our heart, that day when the true value, something of the true value, which our Heavenly Father places upon us will be very apparent. The whole universe joining with the Father, singing over yours and my redemption. Praise God. Amen.